For the last few weeks, my CEO, Keith, and myself, I've been getting together for brief long chats about what's going on in the world of SaaS and our product and our upcoming launch. Eventually, I saw that these conversations were bearing some very interesting fruit, and I decided to start recording them. This is Launch and Learn, Building in Public. You have the idea of like, well, you know, you speak to a whole bunch of people every week and you get, you know, kind of uh, the zeitgeist of challenges people are having and, and the way they're doing scoring or things like that, and that you would kind of download those to me. So do, do you have any any nuggets of wisdom from? <laughs> yeah, the universal signal. The universal signal, okay. The only signal I can think of or that I've encountered that is both risk and opportunity. Whoa. It's key contact left account. Right. The one universal that works, that's meaningful to basically every team, that's meaningful for almost every outcome is whether the person that has a relationship to our business has left the company. Like that's the thing. Mm -hmm. And it's meaningful. It's particularly meaningful if that person was in good standing, if they're happy, if they're healthy, if there's been proven value, they've received it, so on and so forth. It is less meaningful if that person has not received value because they're not going to sell you to the next thing. However, <clears throat> there's still opportunity there. If you get rid of the person who was kind of like the gatekeeper and they weren't great, there is new found opportunity. You get like this reset moment with the new point of contact. So even when that was not going well, a person, a, a key user departing is opportunity. It's also an opportunity if they were, a, you know, a champion and they moved to another company because it creates a new new acquisition. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. So it's uh, it's the universal signal. Every team, every outcome, the thing that matters is if a key person has left. Hmm. Right. So it's a huge input to potential risk is if your go-to person, the person that you know evangelized you and advocated for you and got you into the company and went through the onboarding process with you and did all the training and set it up and got it going, if they leave, that's a huge concern. And right. oftentimes they leave and you have no idea. I mean, we were talking to a prospect, you know, you know who they are. And on their website is a case study for, with a VP who left the company and we know it because we have the behind the scenes scoop. They did not know, mm -hmm. you know, so risk is obvious, but revenue opportunity is even more impactful. Right. You got, you got someone who loves you and they're going elsewhere. It's not like their love for you stopped. You know, yeah. they, they're going to love you there too. And you have basically like a green light. We, uh, I, I bet it's 10 times easier to close a new account when you, you already have a relationship with an advocate. I won't say a decision maker, but at least an advocate there than it is when it's all brand new and getting to know each other for the first time. Yeah. So, yeah, it really dawned on me how important that inflection moment is. And I don't think a single company we've talked to incorporate that into their health scoring systems or their churn scoring systems, or most people don't have upsell or cross sell or expansion scoring systems, but their ICP, what is more ICP than someone that has used your product before? Right. Most ICPs are like, they're in the United States and they use Zendesk and they have a hundred to a thousand companies and they've at least raised a series B. It's like, right. you know, that, you know, so, you know, buyer fit scoring, what is more impactful? That should be an immediate promotion to the highest buyer fit score. They, they have a person here that has been using my software. Mm. So that's the thing I've been thinking about a lot. It's just the universality of this, uh, signal the universal signal. It sounds like there's almost like three playbooks involved for this. There's 
obviously the new um, new acquisition opportunity uh, for you know going right. to the user that's left. Yeah, right. and then there's the churn risk uh, playbook where you would you know immediately need to know have the right people know and immediately reach out to whomever would be the newest administrator of the account to I guess run them through a new onboarding or make sure they're fully adopted, make sure they have everything they need. And then I guess there's also the expansion opportunity if this person that left was not a great advocate um, and there's a greater opportunity with somebody new. Yeah, I mean, I would almost call it, um, expansion is an interesting way to think about it. I would almost call it like uh, re-rolling onboarding. Yeah. You know, it's like we, <clears throat> We all, every software provider wants to do their best. Mm -hmm. They want to do their best by the customers that come in. Like no one is, um, I suppose, unless, you, unless you're in crypto, <laughs> no one is a purposely bad actor. Uh, but we'll cut, we'll cut that out if we release the video. <laughs> um, they know it's true. Yeah, I do. <laughs> they know it's true. Uh, yeah, you know, no, none of us have malicious intent. And so we want to do the best, but some, you know, best laid plans of mice and men, sometimes things go awry and they don't work out the way we want them to. And listen, it's just the reality of when people leave places that creates a transition opportunity. That's the same as if an employee leaves a company, it creates a moment in time in which change and movement is possible because a void has been created and so people employees can land grab they can try and fight for the next position or more responsibility or the vacant role or whatever it might be it's a similar thing when you know a key gatekeeper who's a user leaves it's like hey we can just like clean our hands and start fresh with them we can meet someone else we can you know do better this time we can have better alignment that person had personal stuff going on and we never really got enough of their attention to make it work like you never know why a thing doesn't quite work and when someone leaves it's an opportunity you know it may not be a revenue opportunity but it's a reset opportunity right yeah, yeah. I mean, they have a low satisfaction score of some sort it's an opportunity to expand you know um you make that better, I guess. Let's so, try. Let's try this again. Yeah. Anyways, this is this idea of the universal signal. Um. To me, is super compelling. From what, a, go ahead. From like a parative perspective, um, you know how would it work? It, would we? Um, is there going to be kind of these playbooks that are kind of pre, pre-made um, that are kind of standard? Uh, that they can run that would have it all set I up. I think there's strong recommendations we would make. Um, mm -hmm. And th this is the thing, like, this is where technology is powerful. Okay. So key user left account. Mm -hmm. Someone might be able to track that without a piece of technology. You could go check LinkedIn profiles and see when a key user leaves an account. Like, mm -hmm. that's possible. Um, LinkedIn shut off their APIs for this in 2015. Like they don't want you getting access to this easily. So there's a bunch of other indicators, you know, we can use and companies can use to determine when or if a key user's left account, but let's put those aside. Key user left account. Okay, that could be tracked manually. But I don't just care about key user left account because what I'm gonna do about it depends heavily on the history I have with that key user who left an account. Mm -hmm. Okay, were they happy? Were they engaged? Were there outstanding features they wanted that we never addressed? Had they renewed before? Were they successful? Did they receive value? So on and so forth. Like all of that context is really what would determine the playbook for each individual key user that left an account. So a key user that leaves an account at an at-risk um, account with a renewal date in 90 days is completely different Right. Than the playbook I would run for a um, key user that left an account that had positive NPS, no outstanding support tickets, was part of our customer advisory board, and had recently requested a feature before they left. Like, imagine a key decision maker that loves your product 
they request something. They're like, oh, my God, if you guys had this feature, oh, it would be the best. And then they leave. Mm -hmm. But eventually you address that feature. Wouldn't you love to go prospect to them at the new account and say, hey, Jim, you remember that feature you requested? We just we, we built it. We launched it. How about I show it to you and see how if it can work for your new company? Yeah, you know, so when we talk about that's the role of technology is being able to easily provide that much deeper level of depth. And then obviously the provide the corresponding automation for how you take advantage of those insights, but how I what conceivably looks like the same thing, key decision maker left account or key user left account, but the way in which I would act on that would be completely different. So I think that when, you know, when we think about parative in our software, it's really like, okay, key decision maker or key user left account, what was the context? Was the account in good standing? Had they previously renewed? How far are they from renewal date? What product lines are they using? Now let's look at that contact. What level of activity did they, did they have? Is this the first product they've used from us or uh, did they buy our software at a company prior to this one? Were they happy? Did they have outstanding needs? So on and so forth. And we would run completely different playbooks for different teams based off the unique context of each key user who left the account and the context of the account they're in. Mm -hmm. A human can't keep track of all that. Right. But a software can. Yeah. So like that, that's how we would think about it. We would basically be saying, we're capturing all the necessary context about every level of that company, contact, so on and so forth, in order to generate or recommend it, recommend a playbook for how you take advantage of the universal signal or how you defend against the universal signal if it's a churn risk one. Right. Are are people aware of this? Like when you've talked to people, are they saying this is a thing that's happening and we don't know how to deal with it, or it's like not even on in their on the radar? Um, sales teams seem more in tuned with it as an opportunity right? and, um, risk or retention focus teams tend to be like CSMs and account managers. So like we've had a prospect this week say to me, if you can tell me which contacts from our current customers in specific roles have left the company, that is enough for us to buy you. That's it, that's all it takes. They don't even need the automation layer on top of it or using that single signal in all the other stuff we do like predictive scoring. It's just like, if you can tell me who left, that's worth, that's worth enough money to buy a piece of software for. Because if even one of those becomes a paying customer at their new company, Parity has paid for itself many times over. Okay, so sales teams, at least some of them, kind of seem to get that. Um, the problem for sales teams is in organizations where after the sale, they have nothing to do with the customer population. And so they kind of don't think about current customers. It's like, who's next? Where's the next shiny new object? You know, when CSMs completely own the relationship with current customers and sales kind of, there's this like, culture in a company where sales just doesn't care it's not their responsibility it's not in their purview they just move on to finding another new customer then there seems to be this breakdown in sales caring about it but when there's a closer relationship between sales and success this seems to be more top of mind for a sales organization for csms and account management more like retention and risk focused teams every one of them knows that if uh they just know inherently if i lose a decision maker we are potentially in trouble the problem i see is there's really very little thought around how we operationalize that idea into our day-to-day -day work it's more just like shit. what do we do versus okay we have a series of interventions in place so that when a key decision maker leaves an account or goes silent or whatever we know we know how to how to run a playbook to to protect or take advantage of that. So um, we don't have access to LinkedIn's API. How would even any of these uh, third parties things be able to identify, like in any period of time that's useful, 
when somebody leaves a company? There's some, uh, there's definitely lagging indicators, um, which when you say it like that sounds like a negative, but the reality is if you have no indicators, then the lagging indicator is pretty good. Um, so a lagging indicator would be uh, email bounce. Right, I figured that's one. Yeah, sure. so that's one. Um, there are people scraping LinkedIn for um, for title change. Right, there are. Um, so be it. Right, uh, if that's how they're going to do, they're going to do it. Um, we are ultimately agnostic because we view all of these as data providers. So by working with as many data providers as possible and using our ID matrix to constantly unify the data we have about each contact or customer, we just wait to see when we see a signal for departing. Whether We don't care where that signal came from as long as we trust the accuracy of the signal. Mm -hmm. So um, ultimately, as long as we have enough coverage of types of indicators for that provided by our partners, we are still, even if it's not perfect, perfect would be every time someone left a job, they called Parative and told us they left their job. Okay, so we're not gonna get that. Um, but there's often this like, don't make uh perfect the enemy of good yes right any indicator we give even if it's a lagging one is way better than what most people have today mm -hmm. way better and so we don't even need to know with 100 percent. you know one of uh one of our prospects you know they care about you contacts in a certain role well, we we've, we've identified 50 contacts in that role at one of those target accounts of theirs. And if uh, maybe we don't know about 45 of them and their job change events, but if we know about 10% of them, five, five of them, that's five opportunities. Is there a, is there a world in which some machine learning plays a part in predicting this? For example, if there was an email bounce and the user name user hasn't logged in in a certain period of time like that specific user i think i think it's almost the opposite so yes there's a role machine learning can play in this in sussing out dramatic changes in engagement mm -hmm. okay but an email bounce is an email bounce i don't right. need machine learning to tell me that that's likely uh they've right. left um but someone saying or an email redirect is another like obvious indicator right. that someone has left. Uh, but let's say someone was a power user and there's been a cold turkey stop to usage. Mm -hmm. And there has been no logged email correspondence in the CRM with that contact in roughly the same period of time. Right. And, you know, keep going, some other, uh, behaviors or lack of behaviors, then with a high degree of predictability, we could say, hey, I think that this person may be gone. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a definitely an interesting value to customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I think there's a lot of interesting ways to do this. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, there's the idea of the universal signal and how important it is to all retention and uh, retention risk and revenue teams. But there's also the idea of the lifetime value of a user like ULTV. Like I. Oh, back to the uh, user user. Uh... They are ULTVs. Yeah, I mean, that's what I have. You know, it's not an account. It's person. Right. You know, lifetime value of a human, of a person, of a user like this person has bought my software and received value from it. And when Jim, user Jim, leaves and goes to the second company, what happens to user Jim for most companies? He disappears, he becomes unknown to them. He's just an archaic contact record in their CRM and eventually someone might delete it. 
Yeah. And but let's say a second, let's say user Jim buys the software at company two. What happens? I have now have two users, two user records in my database or contacts in my CRM for the same person, user Jim. But it's one. And imagine if all of that could be merged, the history of each instance of relationship with that user at every company he or she goes to is one unified user record throughout the life of that user. Right. I could be having conversations with that user about his usage of my product at company three and referencing things he did or succeeded with at company one five years ago. Mm -hmm. If I had that single consistent historical record. Right. Super powerful idea. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it seems like something that um, would resonate with, with people. I mean, uh, I think there's still like unknowns about, you know, if we could establish ourselves as like the, the people that know what to do, you know, can help you identify what to do. That's why the automation thing is so important. Right. Because it, it's not tracking and visualizing data is nice. In fact, sometimes it can be really nice. It can be great even. But mm -hmm. doing something about that data or more powerfully, instantly doing the right thing about that data that's the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And people talk about predicting the data. What is about predicting the data? What is that about really? It's about doing the thing you should do when the data occurs earlier, so you don't miss it. But if we could with that, you know, if we can instantly drive some response off of a piece of data on behalf of the customer on behalf of the, the employee and that response is the correct response to drive the outcome we want relative to that data retention risk intervention upsell cross sell like whatever it might be you know you're not replacing an employee you're allowing them to spend more of their time doing the the tasks that should require human intervention, deep understanding of what a customer is trying to accomplish and hand holding to get them to those points of value. You know, but like the standard operating procedure of a customer journey, we develop a customer journey. That's basically like the things we want them to the steps we want them to go through to achieve success and, and long term value and be happy, healthy customers. That stuff should be automated. When something starts to go a little awry, there should be a system that alerts to or automates an intervention to get them back on course. Like, oh, that was just a slight course correction. You almost took a right. Uh, let's get you back on course. But if someone goes way off course or stops driving down that course at all, that's when a human should step in. Like this is this scalable CS, mm -hmm. you know? And so automation is, is about giving more, giving time back to the employee or giving really giving focus back to the employee so he or she can say, these are the moments I'm going to intervene in. I'm not gonna spend my day to day looking at a bunch of little tasks on accounts or checking data line items or logging into my Looker dashboard and seeing that that thing went up and to the right. Like none of that is fucking worth your time. Software can handle all of that better. And by better, I just mean better than you having to do it yourself. So, yeah, I think the automation part here is a key to is key to this. Tracking and reporting on data is nice. You know, using that data as part of a more comprehensive or holistic understanding of a customer is nice, great even. But doing the thing that's supposed to be done when that data tells the story it's telling, that's the, that's really the gold standard. Right. And you know, knowing what to do right yeah no exactly right this is the thing that we have seen works 
at customers at your customer at your company or with this type of customer or with this type of customer in this kind of scenario like right. yeah super valuable uh, opinionated sas right you know um the days of empty excel tables as like the premier software. I mean, that there was a time when an Excel doc was the premier software. Right. Table-based data with no opinion. But now right. employees really like opinions. They so, want, they have, I have so much shit I gotta worry about. Tell me what I'm supposed to do here. It's like playbooks or guided selling or any of these things are all kind of the same prescription. That's right. It's, um, you know, ego fatigue or decision fatigue is a real thing. They, they have done studies where they will, um, <clears throat> When prisoners are up for parole and have parole hearings, there is a direct correlation to time of day when a parole hearing is held and the yep. likelihood for of a prisoner of an inmate being uh, uh, given parole. That's, that sucks. Yeah. It's terrible. It's really unfortunate. But it's it's ego fatigue. Some people refer to it as, or just, you know, more generally decision decision fatigue. People are more capable of making complex, difficult decisions earlier in the day. And so oh, I'm not a morning person. Well, okay. When you wake up, okay. Right. But you, everybody's got a bag of decisions they're capable of making, uh, you know, a finite quantity. And before your decision-making abilities really start to degradate or degrade over time. And so, uh, you know, that happens with inmates in parole. And that's the same with employees. I've got a limited number of good decisions I can make today before I start making not so good decisions because I'm just fried. I've used up all the, all, all the mental faculties I have available to me. And, um, if we can say, we are going to, we're going to save you from having to make decisions that aren't worthy of your attention and provide more mental space for you to focus on making decisions that are worth your attention and are genuinely impactful to the outcome of the business or the success of this account, then we have, it's a mul mul uh, multiplicative effect on the positive effect on the, on the, the company. Right. So, um, yeah, anyways, this, the idea of automating these things is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, I wanted to pick your brain about, you should put this recording out. Yeah. There's a bunch of interesting stuff here. For sure. And it, we'll, we'll, we'll edit some of it, but I think it is really interesting. I think the two points are, you know, the, you know, broadly speaking, being able to identify the signal, but then not only automating the actions, but knowing what it is or, or having being, having the guardrails in place or the, 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 the map given to you about what to do in this scenario. Yeah, yeah, it's really there is a universal signal. We're not paying enough attention to it. And we're certainly not operationalizing it as part of how we do our our jobs. Our primary jobs. Okay. But what I do for that primary uh, to take advantage or, or respond to that universal signal is highly dependent on the context of the scenario, the customer, their history with us, the outcome I'm trying to drive, so on and so forth. And all of, and the response can be automated as long as I know that. As long right. as I deeply understand that context, but I don't want to automate a universal response to a universal signal, right. largely contextual. Right. Universal signal, very, very. Um, yeah, yeah. Universal, yeah. Universal signal, don't want no universal response. Right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, the very fact that it's universal implies that it exists in a wide range of um, scenarios. Right. And not every scenario is the same, obviously. And so the what I need to do, my response should not be universal. Right. But it doesn't mean my response has to be white glove, one to one personal. No. It needs, it's more like one to some. You know, like CSMs are especially enterprise CSMs are obsessed with one to one. They don't want to automate anything because their whole thing is I have a great relationship with Susan. Like 
that they don't want to automate anything. Salespeople, especially earlier in the sales process, marketers, they want to automate as much as possible because it's scale. It's one to many. It's numbers games. But the reality is there's this there's something in between like this one to some. How do I provide what feels like a one to one response or engagement or interaction? But the reality, it's one to some and the sum is all highly similar customers or scenarios mm -hmm. you know so the intervention i would i'm not saying okay universal signal of key user leaves account occurs i don't have one universal response of send email right but maybe i could have a series of one to some responses that are when that that key user was a decision maker was happy healthy had uh positive nps and no outstanding uh product requests then do this when that key user was a champion uh who was inactive blah, blah 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 then do this when that user was in an account which was stalled in onboarding then do this right i mean that applies to every, to all sorts of signals right i mean right. That, that concept could be anything it could be you know the churn signal of someone exporting their data you know there's obviously context that's different for each scenario each time that would happen that would dictate the best response or the best you know playbook to run yeah um, is there a world in which uh imperative um becomes prescriptive in that way in what it's in suggesting um imperative you know, could okay uh when we talk about imperative do we mean imperative software imperatives yeah. humans Imperative humans can already be prescriptive. We just right. I meant imperative as a solution. You know, the, to the end user of imperative, it just seems you know seemingly imperative. I would say I would I when we talk about prescriptive, I I like to think about it as like almost like product market fit. People talk about product market fit as if it's this like transcendental state of being, like nirvana. Once achieved, you have it forever. And that is just not the case. If you have even one person that likes what you've done and uses it and wants to spend money on it, you have product market fit. Market real small. Right. This is market okay. N equals one, but yes. That That's right. Yeah. Market's real small. And your goal is to get the market bigger over time and build a thing that has a broader fit with more people. And as consumer interests change, your product market fit coefficient will change. And your, I mean, as incredibly successful companies die. Yeah. I mean, how did Toys R Us die? Companies, they because they didn't do e commerce. They thought it was they children. They thought, yeah. Uh, shopping behaviors changed and, um, and they did not change their product to continue to maintain that level of product market fit. So anyways, um, prescriptive, be, prescriptive is similar in a way. It's like, okay, um, I want to get better at being, I want to get, um, I want to get prescriptive about more things. I want to get um, better at being prescriptive about the things I'm prescriptive about, meaning probably like, um, uh, more accurate and my prescription drives the outcome more frequently mm -hmm. and it's probably like um i want to get better at being prescriptive for your unique situation okay so those steps are important because we can already be prescriptive and then there's probably automated prescription which is a separate thing um we could already be prescriptive because we know enough about people in the space and how they're trying to solve the problems that we're encountering and that we're trying to build a solution to support so we could already be prescriptive but we can get better at being prescriptive for customer a the longer we work with customer a yeah and eventually we'll get so good at being prescriptive for customer a based off what we've learned about customer a and the customer population of customer a that eventually the software could probably say I, i'll take it from here I've got a, I've got enough to have a baseline. I understand how this in, this um, suggestion impacts the outcomes for this account and these this segment of uh, end users in the account. And I will just tell them when it's time to do something without a human having to do it. Mm -hmm. So I would say 
that we've been smart and that we've built such a flexible modular ecosystem imperative is essentially a sandbox you could use you can it's a lego it's a, not a lego set it's a box of legos you know there's uh eight node legos there's six node legos there's the flat green grass legos that you build stuff on top of like there's a bunch of different types of lego pieces but you can basically use them to build anything you want that was a clear design decision when we tried to build parative versus saying we sell a lego house that's what we sell and you can only make a lego house with it right and the nice part about basically starting with the sandbox versus starting with something that's so specifically focused like all we do is identify pqls and we're the crm for product qualified companies that's a very specific thing to say and you could do that and people are obsessed with plg right now um but, you know crm for plg like people are obsessed with plgs you know the second coming of inbound or whatever kind of content but the reality is that people have far more nuanced goals and outcomes they're trying to drive with the same customer population and they need a variety of tools to do that and the ability to um make those tools flexible to their specific use case if you only have one way your software can be used then when you're prescriptive you're prescribing everyone to do it the same way yeah if your piece of software and all the core concepts that make it up are highly modular or flexible or customizable aka a sandbox the lego the box of legos then you can be prescriptive for each customer and the software can support it mm -hmm. so you know there actually is a really nice outcome of us being so i don't want to say generic because it's has such a negative connotation but the ability for it to um wide yeah wide. yeah it's it's broadly applicable in highly nuanced use cases do you think that given kind of where where it is today and the way we talk about it and the you know the kind of infinite variations of use cases and kind of the different utilization of the different pieces of it that referring to it as a platform is less of a stretch now than it may have been before so there is like some something there so like i i would comfortably call us a platform but when you're talking to people who've heard that language before but haven't heard you they may think a certain thing because the word has connotation and so you know salesforce is clearly a platform it started as an application for one team to do one job and over time became a um, an, uh, an application aggregator all built around sort of the same ecosystem. So it's this platform of applications. HubSpot the same. So HubSpot is the same. And this is how uh, in the first wave of SaaS, a lot of the really successful companies grew. They started with an application layer. They got into a specific team to help them solve a certain job. And over time, they expanded their real estate and became a suite of applications. And then eventually became a platform where other people built their applications. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're almost more like a platform first platform where not like a, you know, we're not a marketplace or nothing like that, but we're agnostic to the data sources. We're almost agnostic to the outcome you're trying to deliver. We're agnostic to the tool sets you use because we've basically identified that every company is different every product line or suite of products is different the outcomes that people are trying to drive are different even if two people are trying to drive, reduce churn and drive retention what that means to them and their product suite and their monetization model and their contracting timeline is all different and so we've basically said okay we're taking a we're going to be a invisible application that's agnostic to the other applications you use and we're going to leverage those applications to drive value in those applications via our application that you don't actually log into mm -hmm. you know like it so yes i would say i think we are a platform 
but it just doesn't match the historical connotation that I think a lot of people have in mind when they say that. Yeah, I mean, it's just semantics, but like the one I, you know, I think about there are separate kind of nodes that are kind of becoming apparent to me now. Um, you know, I think about the the unified customer data as clearly a thing that could be its own software. There's obviously the feedback that could be its CDP own. Life. It's what? a customize. It's a customizable CDP. It's like a CDP life. Segment life. It's a no code CDP. Whatever it is, you know what I mean. Like um, that. So like I'm seeing there are these pieces. You know, there's the widget that could essentially act as anything. Um, so. I don't know. It seems like, in my mind, it becomes more relevant as than an engine. It's more of like the operating system or something. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, intercom moved to engagement OS. Right. Um, I've had a lot of success in past companies using intercom. I have nothing, not a thing in the world to say negative about intercom. It's an interesting positioning, engagement OS. Like we're the operating system for driving engagement with your end user population. I don't know if it's accurate. Uh, most names are largely aspirational before they become true. And what's funny is uh, most companies, once their aspirational name becomes true, they create a new aspirational name to go for the bigger thing. You know, yeah. uh, inbound marketing, but once inbound marketing was true, inbound marketing and sales uh, and then let's figure out the sales part or drift uh, conversational marketing, you know, chatbot. And now once conversational marketing was relatively uh, real, then they immediately went to revenue acceleration platform. I, I think they actually walked away from it, um, but you know, conversational marketing was something that could be easily commoditized and so it behooved them to do something bigger. And, you know, those guys are great at, at branding. And um, I worked with Cancel and Elias and love those guys. They're awesome. But yeah, it is, it is interesting how people do bail on, they bail on the thing that's true once it's no longer aspirational or expand beyond it. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyways, you know, for us, I mean, for us, even calling ourselves a scoring engine, it's a little disingenuous because it's one thing we do. One of, one of several that are equally robust and powerful, but you're trying to play games with language that people understand. And so, you know, I'm hesitant to call our you know, our uh, data, our customer data unification tech, a CDP. We shouldn't. I think CDP has a lot of hair on it. It should be, but it, 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 the it, exact same way. Right. And so when I see startups come out and they say, we're a composable CDP or we're, a, you know, whatever, uh, the light CD, we're CDP for non-enterprise or whatever they say, I'm like, part of me is like, damn, they're ballsy, like brave fuckers. But right. another part of me is like, I don't think that's the right way to go forward with this.